Hi guys, I'm Miracle Jade here and welcome back to my channel. If you caught my video last week, I am now doing a series where I will be discussing the book versus the movie adaptation. The first episode, which was last week, talked about Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, which was the first book in the series. And if you missed that video, it'll be linked up here or down here somewhere. This video, episode two, will focus on Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. So while I discuss Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, book versus movie, I will also be doing my makeup. Not gonna focus on the makeup too much. Not really. The, that's not gonna be the wave. I'm not gonna, yeah. But if you would like to know what I use on my face, I will put it in the description box below so that you can go cop it or go, go get it, go use it. I don't know what you're gonna do with it. If you want it, it'll be down there. So without further ado, I'm gonna dive right on in. Oh, um. I know it's YouTube. I'm supposed to say like like and subscribe or something like that. But um, yeah, if you like it, like it. If you, if you don't, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna keep going with these, so maybe they'll get better. They will get better. I mean, I'm hoping. Maybe they'll get better. We'll see. We'll see. But um, if you do like it, like and subscribe, because I will be here every week supplying you with um, book and movie differences. It'll be it'll be amazing. On this journey together, guys on this journey together but like i said i'm gonna dive on in so let's get started all right guys we're on the second one now right harry potter and the chamber of secrets and in this book harry has you know less abuse by his aunt and uncle aunt petunia and uncle vernon so instead of living under the cover he is now living in dudley's second bedroom which is still pretty small bedroom considering but um you know at least he's out from under the cupboard at least some of the abuse has has subsided so um he's making some strides when we start off with the movie harry is at aunt petunia's and uncle vernon's and he is upset because it's the summertime and none of his friends have contacted him um he also isn't allowed to let hedwig out which is his owl because uncle vernon and aunt petunia are terrible people so he's cooped up in this room and so is Hedwig and he's like, oh my God, do my friends hate me? Like, what's going on? Are they okay? I'm just gonna wait for them to write to me because like, I don't wanna seem all desperate. I don't know, He he's just, he he's low key thinking like, did I even go to Hogwarts? Cause no one has contacted me. I like have no contact with the wizarding world at all. And he's kind of down about it. So. In the meantime, Uncle Vernon is about to have this huge dinner with this client for his job and they're coming over and so Harry has to stay upstairs in his room and pretend like he does not exist. Which he's like, okay, that's easy enough. So when he goes upstairs into his room, he finds, boom, house elf, Dobby. Dobby's, you know, there to give Harry a warning saying, hey, no, you can't go back to Hogwarts next year because there's a plot and I don't know what's about to go down and I must protect you. And Harry's like, um, well, Hogwarts is my home, so I'm gonna go back. Dobby's like, no, even your friends don't want you to go back. They're not even writing to you. And Harry's like, hold up, wait a minute, w wait a minute. How in the world do you know? Do How do you know my friends aren't writing to me? And then Dobby's like, <laughs> Well, you see, I've been stealing all of your letters from your friend so that you don't receive them so that maybe you, you don't want to go back to school, maybe, you know, so that maybe you just want to stay here miserable with the Dursleys for the rest of your life. And Harry's like, yo, give me my letters, give me my stuff. And of course, Dobby runs down into where the dinner party is taking place. So here is the first difference that I have noticed between the movie and the book. So in the movie, Dobby runs downstairs, there's this huge pudding cake looking thing, and Dobby's like, snap. And cake lifts up, he's gonna literally dump it onto the Dursley's guest's head. And Harry's like, oh my god, like no, please don't. And Dobby's like, yo, tell me right now that you're not gonna go back to Hogwarts, because if, you, if you, you tell me, I won't do it. Of course, Harry's like, I can't just tell you that, that'd be a lie, which I, between you and me. He should have lied. I'd have lied. I'd have been like, sure, I ain't going back. And then what I have done, I'd have slid my behind right into Hogwarts where I belong. I would have just lied. But he didn't lie because he's Harry Potter. So he's like, no. So of course, Dobby snaps his little fingers and the pudding cake thing falls right onto the guest's head. That's what happens in the movie. 
So in the book, all of that still happens, but what happens next is where things get a little spicy. But what happens is, once that cake pudding falls onto the guest's head, an owl flies in and drops envelope right there. And the envelope is from the Ministry of Magic. In the wizarding world, underage wizards are not allowed to do magic outside of Hogwarts. They can do it on the train to Hogwarts and once they get to Hogwarts. They're under age and they're not at Hogwarts, they're not allowed to do it. It's forbidden and if you do it, you can get expelled. So that message came straight from the Ministry of Magic because they have sensed in that immediate vicinity where Harry Potter lives that magic has been performed. And since magic has been performed, they assume that it's Harry and give him a warning. So that's what the letter says. It drops and it's like, oh yeah, at 8.52 this day at 4 Privet Drive, a levitation spell has been performed and you know that is against our rules of underage wizardry. We will expel you if you do it again, essentially. And <laughs> that ruffled the, the Dursley's feathers a little bit because they spent the whole summer thinking that Harry could do magic. They did not know that Harry could not do magic outside of Hogwarts. So now they like, oh really? Oh, oh really? So you really can do magic outside of Hogwarts? Oh, okay. All right, well we about to unleash it. We about to, we about to pop off. We about to unleash it in here. And so that's, that's what they did. They put bars on his windows. They started treating him like crap once again. And of course he got in trouble because you know, I'm pretty sure Vernon lost that account that he was trying to get so desperately with that client because you know, now they're walking out of the house with pudding all over their heads. But I digress, that is the first difference from the movie and the book. Well, first important difference. And you'll see why it's important like later on that underage wizards are not allowed to do magic. We fast forward a little bit. Harry's been, you know, trapped in, in the room. He's locked in there. So who shows up? To save him, Ron Weasley, because he's the GOAT. Ron comes with his brothers, breaks him out of the Dursleys, and they head back to the burrow. So he gets to stay at the burrow for a while, which the burrow is the Weasleys' home. Dumbledore says it's okay, and you know, the Weasleys are like, cool, that's fine with me, you can stay here, and even Harry's Hogwarts letter shows up there, so he, you know, he's all good. He's living the life, and he loves it. He's living in the, the wizarding world for the first time which is so fascinating for him because he doesn't know that much. So they have to, of course, go to Diagon Alley so that Harry can get his money and his school books. Well, all the kids, because you know, the Weasleys have seven kids, but five of them are in Hogwarts currently. Four of them? Percy, the two twins. No, five of them are in Hogwarts currently. So they have to go to Diagon Alley to go get all their stuff and they, they decide to meet up with Hermione to go on the same day. And the way that they travel, since underage wizards can't disapparate or apparate, they use flu powder. In order to use flu powder, you have to drop the powder into the fire, step into the fire and verbalize, like verbally say where you want to go. And you have to speak very clear. Of course, Harry jumps in there. In the book, he gets a mouth full of soot and starts coughing and that's what happens. In the movie, he doesn't say Diagon Alley, he just says diagonally. So, I don't know, that was a difference, but you know. So, Wush, he is off to Diagon Alley, but does he show up at Diagon Alley? No, wrong. He is now in Nocturne Alley, which is right next to Diagon Alley, so not too far. And he has landed into this really creepy store, and the store is called Borgen and Burks. And this is where we come into the next difference that I would like to discuss. So Harry's in Borgen and Burks and all of a sudden he sees out of the window that someone's about to enter and the person who's about to enter has blonde hair. Who is it? Draco. It's always, it's always Draco. It's Draco Malfoy. Draco Malfoy is about to slide in there with his daddy and so Harry hides in a cabinet because he doesn't want them to see that he's there and you know make fun of him and all that stuff because he's all beat up from flying through a bunch of fireplace grates. So he hides in this cabinet which this cabinet is important, so note that. Keep that in your head. We're gonna talk about that like later down the line. But he hides in this cabinet and he's peeking out and Draco's dad, Lucius Malfoy, is there and Lucius is like talking to the owner. I think his name, I think he was Borgen. I don't know, if, I don't think it was Burke. I think it was Borgen. So he's talking to the owner and he's like, hey, like, I have to get, oh, by the way, look at, look at these. 
their wands. I don't know if you can see, but yeah. My friend, shout out to you, Montana, because she got me all of these wand brushes, like eye brushes, and I love them. But um, yeah, like I was saying, he's talking to the owner, Morgan, and he's like, hey, the ministry are raiding people's houses right now, and I really need the stuff out of my house because it's it's full of dark magic. Like, I will get in trouble if they find this in my house. Of course, Bergen is like, um, well, I'll see what I can do. And he's like, yo, you better see what you can do. I can't catch a case right now, essentially. He can't, he can't, he can't do it. So he's trying to get rid of all this illegal stuff that he's not supposed to have. Once they leave, Harry heads out and Hagrid finds him and they head to um, Diagon Alley. Difference. And I know I've talked in my last one about it. I do not hate Hermione. I don't like how she's depicted in the movies. I don't. I love her character in the books, but she's kind of over, you'll see what I mean. You'll you'll just see what I mean. Harry, of course, when he went through the rates, he like broke his glasses. They're cracked, the, the lenses are cracked and stuff. So he finally gets back to everybody and Hermione runs up to him in the movie and is like, oh my God, Harry, you're okay. We've been worried sick. Then she's like, what did you do to your glasses? And then Oculus Reparos them, Johns in the middle of Diagon Alley. Is she at Hogwarts? I don't think so. Was she out here casting spells and stuff outside of Hogwarts for it? Who, who said that was all right? Like, she should be getting a letter saying like underage, you know, magic has been performed. You now have a warning. Back out on my nerves. Then, you know, they go into Flourish and Blocks to get their books. In the movie, they all run into Lucius Malfoy. And Arthur Weasley is also in Flourish and Blots, and he's like, hey guys, like, you know, let's head outside. And he runs into Lucius as well. In the movie, Lucius, he just slings some insults at them. Um, some really typical insults, like, oh yeah, yeah, you're poor. And then they head out and that's it. In the book, Lucius said some things and Arthur wasn't taking it. So they start fist fighting in the middle of Flourish and Blocks. And Hagrid had to come. Hagrid had to pull Arthur off of Lucius and drag them outside. And it was it was a whole big thing and they kind of skipped over that. I mean, it's, it's not a huge, huge scene, but they added a lot of action into this movie. So I don't know why they didn't add in that fight. Cause that would have been cool to see. I want to see Arthur Weasley throw down. Lucius and if I keep squinting I'm sorry I'm so blind without my glasses I need contacts honestly but will I get them no because that's money so I'm just gonna kind of like jump ahead in the um, storyline a little bit so they try to go to Hogwarts or running late of course so Harry and Ron can't get through on platform nine in three quarters the gate has sealed itself and they are essentially locked out. Instead of just waiting for Arthur and Molly Weasley to just come back through, they decide to take their car, their enchanted car, which is a Ford Angelina, and drive it all the way to Hogwarts. When they get there, they crash into the Whomping Willow, the car goes haywire, and runs off into the forbidden slash dark forest, because, you know, sometimes they say dark forest, sometimes it's forbidden forest. I don't know which one, which one we going with, but that's essentially what happens. So we fast forward a little bit and we get to this scene where Harry is headed to Quidditch practice and they find out that Slytherin team has booked the pitch. They're, they're upset because it's like, you know, we booked the pitch for today and of course Slytherin's like, no, we gotta train our new seeker. Find out the new seeker is none other than Draco Malfoy, of course. So Harry's like, oh no. And then Ron and Hermione come over and they're like, uh-oh. Like it's about to go down because you know we don't like Draco well they don't like Draco I like Draco I think he's fun so Draco's like yeah that's not the only thing that's new this year he shows them the Nimbus 2001s and Hermione is like oh at least no one on the Gryffindor team had to buy their way in because they got in on their own pure talent of course that strikes a chord with the um, young Malfoy here and he goes ahead and calls her a mudblood and in the movie he calls her a mudblood Ron is like, oh no, and jinxes him, which of course his wand has been broken when they ran into the Whomping Willow. It backfires. He is now spread out on the ground, puking up slugs. So they take him to Hagrid, 
and you know Hagrid's like yo like well what happened like why was Ron trying to curse Malfoy anyway and Harry's like well I don't really know he said something but I don't really know what it meant and then Hermione pipes in Hermione's like he called me a mudblood it's a foul name for someone who's muggle born someone with non-magic parents like me and she's crying and she's all upset and then of course you know Hagrid's like oh no you know give her a little pep talk like you know you're one of the brightest witches I ever known blah 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 don't don't let that get you down and that's how it happens in the movie wrong that is incorrect 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 and this is where my gripes with Hermione begin Hermione is a muggle-born meaning her parents aren't witches or wizards they're they're, they're non-magic she grew up in the regular world like Harry even though Harry's parents are magic they still both grew up in the the non-magical world that's what they know Ron however grew up in the magical world both of his parents are magic and that's what he knows right so in the book ron is the one who explains what a mudblood is ron is the one who is upset because he knows what a mudblood is in the movie hermione is the one who's upset but when i watch that i'm like how does she know what a mudblood is i mean maybe, maybe a book that she's read has touched on it but even if it did, why is it upsetting her so much? It kind of doesn't make sense for her to know what a mudblood is, seeing as how she has never experienced being in the wizarding world. She shouldn't be that hurt by it, if that makes any sense. She really shouldn't. She should be kind of chilling, because in the book, when she gets called a mudblood, she has no reaction to it because she doesn't know what it means. Ron is the one who explains what it is and is like, oh no, like that's disgusting. That's like the lowest of the low you can call somebody. And that's where she's like, oh, but she still kind of doesn't feel anything about it because she didn't grow up in that world. She doesn't understand just how rude and how messed up being called that truly is. She has no clue. So I don't like how they took Ron's line, the person who's actually grown up in the wizarding world and gave it to Hermione because quite frankly, it doesn't make sense for her to know that. It just doesn't. And that brings me to my next difference, which also involves Hermione. We fast forward a little bit. After they find Mrs. Norris petrified, he is telling Hermione and Ron like yeah I heard voices you guys didn't hear that voice and they're like what voice when they get interrogated by the teachers they don't mention that Harry has heard those voices they don't mention it at all right so as they're leaving Harry's like do you think I should have told them that you know I was hearing voices and in the movie Hermione is like no even in the wizarding world Harry hearing voices is not a good sign once again how do you know that hearing voices in the wizarding world isn't good? You're not from the wizarding world. You're not. So I don't understand why you have that line. In the book, she doesn't have that line. Who has that line? Let me hear it. Ronald Weasley. And they kind of just took that from him, which is quite a shame because Ron is one of my favorite characters in the book. And he is one of my favorite characters because even though he's not as smart as Hermione, he still is hilarious, number one. And he's that bridge, he's that insight to the wizarding world that we need because he's the one who grew up in the wizarding world. Hermione hasn't grown up in the wizarding world and neither has Harry. So we need to know what, what's going on in the wizarding world. And Ron was that person who was there to kind of let us know what was going on in the wizarding world and since I loved Ron's character so much I felt really really short changed because we didn't get to we didn't get to see that because they gave it all to Hermione because I guess they felt that she should know everything since she's the smart one which still doesn't make any sense because she didn't grow up in the wizarding world please excuse that gnat that's like in my face I try to film and then the gnat just keeps 
keeps coming around and I'm gonna get it one day it's going it's going down just to stay on this Hermione track for a bit I would like to mention that there are multiple times where she has been given these powers that are way beyond a second year. There's the scene where the pixies are all loose in the Defense Against the Dark Arts class, and of course, Gilderoy Lockhart being the uh, coward that he is, he's like, hey, like, you know, you guys can just get the rest nipped into their cages. And in the movie, Hermione's like, okay, like, I got this. And she stands up and she does a mobulus and she just freezes every single pixie that's there like extremely powerful 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 spell she does it all on her own no help boom got it in the book she could only freeze about one or two at a time which makes more sense for her being a second year like yes she is a very 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 strong bright and powerful witch she is she's amazing i'm not taking that away from her at all whatsoever i love hermione if i haven't said it before i will say it again i love hermione i really do for you know them being students it's just not feasible it's not feasible for her to be that strong it's not um another example is when the bludger is like about to hit harry after the game after he catches the snitch and she just blasts it into smithereens see she didn't do that Dumbledore did it how would she know to do that and why wouldn't any other teacher do that they're letting a second year save their student when they're literally sitting right they're sitting right there they they no that doesn't make any sense they wouldn't let the second year do it they really they wouldn't they would have done it and that's why in the book they do do it like Dumbledore does it I would say it's not fair because they make everyone else look idiotic in comparison to Hermione and um JK Rowling did a really good job at balancing everyone out like everyone has their flaws everyone has their like strengths and weaknesses and stuff but in the movie they made it very very one-sided in the movies Hermione has no flaws she can do no wrong she's she knows everything she's very super smart she's just essentially perfect and JK Rowling did not write her that way and that's why I liked her because she wasn't perfect because no one is perfect but we're gonna continue on so in the book we actually find out that Filch is a squib so I'm gonna explain what a squib is because it's kind of important later on in the stories and they should have mentioned it so that we kind of knew what it what it was so essentially a squib is a person who has magical parents but can't perform magic just like a muggle family can have a child who can do magic there are some wizarding families who have children who can't do magic and they are called a squib so that is why Argus Filch is the caretaker and you don't see him running around with a wand and you don't see him using any spells he does everything by hand which kind of sucks like if I was a caretaker I would love to use some magic get your job done quicker but no he is a squib and harry finds that out by being in his office he was about to get detention actually and he found the letter and filch got so mad that he now knew he was a squib that he kicked harry out he was like yeah go because he was just embarrassed which is a shame another thing that they don't mention is nearly headless nick so what happened is nearly headless nick helped harry get out of detention with filch i forget what time i don't i don't know but at some point nearly headless nick helps harry and Harry feels kind of indebted to him, so nearly Headless Nick is like, hey, so if you wanna pay me back, would you mind coming to my death day party? Cause he's a ghost and he's dead, and instead of celebrating their birthday, they celebrate their death day, the day that they died. And Harry's like, yeah, sure, I'll, you know, reluctantly, I'll go, cause it, the party is going to take place on Halloween night in the dungeons, and of course, on Halloween, they have a huge, huge feast in the great hall and harry doesn't want to miss it but doesn't want to let nearly headless nick down so they ended up going and the reason why sir nicholas wants harry to go to the party is because he invited this group called the headless hunt so the headless hunt are a group of ghosts who were all beheaded they get to carry their heads around essentially 
and nearly headless Nick since he is almost headless he wants to join so bad but of course they're like no just because you know you're nearly headless doesn't mean your head is all the way off of your body so no you can't join so what nearly headless Nick wants is he's like hey Harry is famous if they see me with a famous wizard who likes me and you know Harry says a couple of really nice things about me maybe 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 they'll let me join so he wants Harry to essentially go there and talk him up oh my god Nick is a great person which he is they go down into the dungeons the party has food but all of the food is old and rotten and then that's how ghosts can kind of taste it since the smell is so strong they they basically go to the end of the table open their mouth and float through it and they can kind of taste it but that's another difference they should, i think they should have included the death day party i like them including ghosts but speaking of ghosts another part that they changed is the scene where professor mcgonagall is talking about the chamber of secrets so professor mcgonagall she teaches transfiguration right so in the movie they're all in transfiguration class trying to turn animals into wart goblets and Hermione is just like hey like I'm gonna ask a question I'm gonna ask about the chamber of secrets like what is it wrong so in the book there's this professor who teaches the history of magic and his name is professor Binns and professor Binns is you guessed it he's a ghost he's a ghost professor Binns is teaching the class and he's described as being extremely boring so he's teaching the class and no one's listening him. no one's paying attention they're talking about like a goblin rebellion maybe I don't know every time they talk about history they always talk about goblin rebellions and I'm like oh but um so they're talking about something and that's when Hermione raises her hand and asks about the chamber of secrets because of course he's the history teacher he should know what it is right once she asked that question and professor Benz was shocked because when people are bored in this class usually no one ever asks some questions and then everybody in the class kind of perked up because they're like ooh like i want to know i want to know what happened in the chamber of secrets like this is you know this is happening now like what's going on so um professor Benz is actually the one who discusses what happens in the chamber of secrets and you know about the the founders of hogwarts and that there's a monster that lies within the chamber and all that all that lovely stuff so we fast forward a little bit and harry has now found tom riddle's diary after someone has tried to dispose of it in the girl's bathroom that they have made the polyjuice potion in and all that good stuff so harry now has this diary and he doesn't know how it works so he's carrying it around gilderoy lockhart seeing how everyone is upset because everybody's getting petrified everybody out here getting getting targeted and getting attacked he's like you know what it's valentine's day let's do some valentine's day stuff so what he does is he hires all of these dwarves and the dwarves are basically walking around dressed as like cherubs i think and they're delivering heartograms to to people so you pay a couple of, of nuts or something like that a couple of sickles and you get to send a heartogram to someone you really, really like. And Harry has been going through it when it comes to his popularity this year because Gilderoy Lockhart is a fame whore. He's obsessed with his fame and his celebrity and Harry's there and he considers Harry a celebrity, which Harry does not like. Harry's like, pause, I'm not a celebrity. I just go here and that's it. I don't want, I don't want all this notoriety. I just want to go class and go back go back to my dormitory and hang out with my friends that's all Harry wants but does he get that no Lockhart has been like oh my god like let's take pictures together oh you're a celebrity Harry you don't have to do this and of course Draco is just eating that mess up he just eating it up just eating it he eating it up he just starts making fun of Harry about it and on top of that a bunch of people especially a bunch of people in Hufflepuff think that Harry is the heir of Slytherin since he's a parcel now they think he's going around trying to kill students and attacking students so um it's just not a great it's not a great social year for Harry it's not not really that it's not that lovely so he's walking in the hallway he has Tom Riddle's diary in his rucksack and he's just walking down the hallway when one of those little cherubs stops him to sing him a love song 
and Harry being the shy and oh my god you know embarrassed type of person that he is and the year that he's having he's like kill me now he is trying to get out of it. he need to get out of there he's like oh my god get me away please don't sing to me in the hallway in front of everybody mouth is there about to make fun of him so he tries to bolt he just tries to dip he tried to get out of there but the, the cherub is literally holding he's holding his rucksack like no i gotta deliver my song which i'm assu i'm assuming the song is from jenny weasley because jenny loves him but yeah so he's like no i need to go sing my song to you because you know i got paid and you can't run away so he's holding on to harry and harry's just like let me go like i need i need to go like please don't do this to me he's pulling the cherub is pulling and then all of a sudden his bag explodes. The ink falls all over the diary. Everyone's watching, we got Malfoy there, Jenny Weasley's there, and all of his stuff just, it's all over the place. The diary's full of ink, he grabs all this stuff and just bolts. The book put that in for many reasons. In the movie, Harry is sitting at the desk just with the diary and tries to drop some ink on it like randomly one day. Once he drops the ink on it, that's when he notices that it disappears and that's when he's like, ooh. I'm gonna start writing in it and see what happens. It must be magic. So that is how he figures out that the diary is magic in the movie. In the book, he drops all that ink on the diary and when he gets back to the dormitory, he takes it out and all of his stuff is filled with ink except for the book. The book looks like it's untouched. And he's like, what kind of witchcraft is this? So he goes to go look at it and since it's empty that's when he decides hey like maybe it's absorbing the ink so he drops some ink on it and then he writes in it in the movie Ginny Weasley is the one who was setting the basilisk on the mudbloods and she realized that the book was possessing her so she decided to get rid of it so she's the one who disposed of it in the girl's bathroom and she thinks it's gone she's like okay got rid of it it's gone don't have to deal with it we good wrong so in the movie we just have to assume that she like overheard them talking about the diary and that's why she goes back to go get it from Harry she like trashes the dormitory and finds the journal and takes it that's what we have to assume in the book she was there when Harry's bag opened and it, you know broke or ripped or whatever and she saw the the diary that is how she knew where to look to get that diary back. See? And you do that in the movie, we just had to assume, but they explained it in the book. With all that being said, this is definitely gonna be a shorter video because there are not that many differences between the movie and the book. So do you need to read the book in order to understand the rest? If you were to just watch the first movie and watch the second movie and then read the books you'd be kind of you'd kind of be right on track you you don't have to read the book the movie does an amazing job at putting all the necessities in there there are some inconsistencies of course but it does a great job of putting the meat and potatoes in there i really enjoy the first two those are actually my favorite two movies um, they're not my favorite two books, but they are my favorite two movies just because they are the closest to the books. Chris Columbus is the director and he did amazing on the first two and then once he stopped directing them, I will say it, it only goes downhill from here because once we get to that third one, man. Don't get me started on that fourth one. That fourth one, that fourth one ain't it. I don't know what they were thinking. They they cut so much. Let me stop, let me stop, let me stop, let me stop. We'll get there, we'll get there. And you, you will see for yourself what happens. Until next time. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, like I say, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying. I'm pretty sure this one's gonna be better than the first one and I think the next one's gonna be better than this one so there's no place to go but up, okay? So you might as well subscribe and just see my progress and see how better my content gets. It's only gonna get better, I'm trying. Thank you for watching and I'll catch you next time.